Chris We're calling this meeting to order. Okay. The uh, regular meeting of the town council this October 4th, 2016. Um, roll call, Betsy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have um, yourself, uh, Mayor Flax, Councillor Andupas, Councillor Barber, Councillor Grimm, Councillor Morton, Councillor Nall, Councillor Perzati, and Councillor Watson. And uh, Councillor Della Cruz is away celebrating his anniversary. Thank you. Uh, for recognition, oh, I'm sorry, salute to the flag. Scott and Roseanne, could you lead us to salute to the flag? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We do have a uh, recognition award and or memorial. Council Perizzotti. Oh, is that a bad choice? Would you mind reading it? <laughs> I thought it was calculated. Here you go. Sorry. You got it? Lions Club International Centennial. Whereas in 1917, founder Melvin Jones, a Chicago businessman, proposed a modest idea for the members of his business club to reach beyond business issues and address the betterment of their communities and the world, thereby creating the Association of Lions Clubs. And whereas in three short years, their efforts spread internationally, and today the 1.4 million members of the Lions Club International extend their mission of service every day in local communities to all corners of the globe, including more than 200 countries and geographic locations meeting human, human sorry, humanitarian needs and encouraging peace and promoting international understanding through 46,000 Lions Clubs. And whereas each day around the world, these lions of all walks of life fulfill needs of these communities as well as our own in ways both great and broad, including the areas of sight, health, youth, elderly, the environment, and disaster relief. And whereas these dedicated lions have already surpassed their incredible goal of serving one million people worldwide by June 2018, nearly 100,000 people of which were served by Lions Clubs International District 23C com compromised of Lions in Middlesex, New London, Tolland, and Wyndham Counties. And whereas Lions Club International President Chancellor Bob Cor Corlew and Lion Diane Corlew on their Lions Centennial Bus Tour join our Lions as they celebrate 100 years of humanitarian cannot say that word. <laughs> Humanitarian <laughs> service and prepare for their second century of service by conducting and highlighting their vital projects and programs here in southeastern Connecticut. Now therefore be it resolved that the Groton Town Council on behalf of Groton residents join in celebrating the Lions Club's International Centennial and thank them wholeheartedly for all that they have done and continue to do throughout the world and especially here in our own community. Dated Groton, Connecticut this 25th day of September 2016. Thank you, Council Perizzotti. And I was fortunate enough to uh, read this proclamation at the um, at the event, which was um, at Eastern Point Beach um, two Sundays ago, and we got a, a, a little banner to hang that we met Chancellor Bob Corlew, International's president on this 100th anniversary bus tour. So we'll give this to you, Betsy, and maybe we can hang it somewhere in the town. Very, very special uh, banner there. So. Um, next on the uh, on the docket is receipt of citizens' petitions, comments, and concerns. We have two people signed up. This is the portion of the council agenda where the council welcomes comments from citizens. Each presentation should be limited to five minutes or less, and citizens should, if possible, submit written comments. Presentations should be related to matters pertinent to Groton. Town councilors will only ask questions in order to clarify the speaker's presentation and can respond during the responses to citizens' petitions portion of the town council meeting. Citizens should make their presentation from the lectern and state their name and addresses for the record. And the first up is Roseanne Katowski. Good evening, Roseanne Katowski, 24 Ann Avenue, Mystic. I do not support the school project on the November 8th ballot for many reasons. 
it is too expensive and taxes will increase significantly. There are questions as to the reimbursement rates as well as if Groton will receive the diversity grant. The town does not own the merit property and finally there is no documentation available that new buildings improve the quality of education. Groton must fund projects based not on what we wished we had, but on the dollars we actually have available to spend. I also understand that money does need to be spent on the schools and would support smaller projects, such as additions to replace portable classrooms, as well as replacing the boiler at Westside, as two examples. As for the racial imbalance in one elementary school, there are other possibilities in order to correct the problem without spending $184,500,000. Reconfiguring four of the elementary schools to a sister school scenario is just one. So I am urging Groton voters to vote no for the school project referendum on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Scott Amon. Good evening, counselors. Scott, I'm at 127 Rogers Road, Groton. How you guys doing? Hi. How are you? I'd like to thank you, counselors, for your efforts this year on the budget. I know how hard it is, and I appreciate it. But I'm not here to talk about uh, the budget. I'm here to talk about the uh, school project, and I suggest to the uh, voters a no vote uh, that is going to them November 8th. I believe your task force did do a good job. They worked hard for three years, but I feel it fell short. To the people of Groton, I ask you, did the task force and the consultant not learn the lessons of the last failed school project? The New London Day has urged a vote of no based on the information provided to them. Coupled with tax increases of three to 4% approximately over the last two years, this new debt and your taxes will be going up a lot. Moreover, these figures do not include the existing town debt. The Groton 2020 plan with the current debt will be a 2.72 mil increase at its peak. That's over $600 more in that year based on an average assessed value of $223,800 per home. Not to mention any increase from the annual budget or the upcoming revalue. The Groton 2020 plan is contingent on several things, plus financial support from our state, which we know is in dire straits financially. One, it is gambling that our elementary schools will be in balance as of October 1st. We don't know that yet, but that's what they think they're gonna have. Two, it needs a waiver because it exceeds the education building spec of $450 per square foot. Three, the acquisition of the merit property has not been attained. Four, students will still have to be moved around to address some imbalances after the buildings are done. <clears throat> These projects' goals were to improve school facilities long range and to minimize the racial imbalance. It does improve our facilities, however, it only modestly improves the imbalance in the elementary schools. So the plan is to spend $185 million to fix a very small student imbalance issue this does not make sound fiscal sense to me. With the state's fiscal issues and now an education funding case going to the state Supreme Court, Groton is putting way too much faith and responsibility in Hartford. Look at what they did to New London and Ledger. So if the referendum fails, proponents should not look toward the people who imposed it for alternatives. Smaller, more efficient projects should be the focus, not three-in-one expansive projects. Maybe if we could reduce some duplication and come together during budget time, we could reduce the annual budget crunch and pass a few capital improvement projects on our schools, as Roseanne mentioned. So direct the manager and the superintendent before their budget starts. I don't have a crystal ball, but I feel we're on a very bad trend. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak for public comment? Nobody? Okay. That brings us to response to citizens' petitions, comments, and concerns. Yeah. Councilor Antibas? Yes, very shortly. The, as you're, you're well aware, the task force, uh, their do-nothing option, they valued it at roughly $50 million. Um, and I think we all know that if the project doesn't go through, there will surely be a series of 
uh, capital improvement projects could be a roof, a furnace, or this or that or whatever. What is, based on your research, what is your opinion as to the value that the task force put on the do-nothing option, i.e. $50 million? Do you think it's, it's about right? Do you think it's less than that? In other words, what, what do you see as coming down the pike? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, I, I'm, I'm just, I, you, I, it's, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just saying if you have an idea, is that 50 million do nothing value accurate or is it kind of like the dog pound where people said, oh, I, I can do that for half a million, you don't need a million, something like that. We can't answer that because okay. uh, the information at hand uh, to make those, uh, uh, those uh, decisions weren't given to us, but uh, hypothetically, I could probably suggest that I think a lot of those were overstated. That's just my opinion. Uh, I don't know all the facts. I know that uh, there were some previous um, people who worked for the Board of Education that said a lot of the uh, uh, repairs were somewhat overstated. Okay. That's, I'm not giving any names. That's just what I heard. Right. Okay. Thanks. That's a no. I uh, just want to say for the record, the editorial in the day for the no vote uh, it was very clear that was their position, but it was based on the overlap of multiple layers of government that are overlapping in our town. And I can't agree with them more on that part, but I still, well, we're not supposed to say anything else. No. But, um, and if we had, <clears throat> could reduce some of the multiple um, departments that are in the city, Grot Long Point, Noank, and the town, we could save a lot of money and it could go towards those schools. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. They move to the consent calendar. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move the consent calendar. Second. We have a motion to move the consent calendar by <coughs> Councilor Watson and second by Councilor Antipas. Any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That passes eight to zero to zero. Which brings us to communications and reports. Councilor Antibas? Amen. Okay. That's a consent calendar. Okay. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, September 21st, I uh, thank you. I was able to take the mayor's place at the change of command ceremony at the uh, at the Groton Navy Base. I know they refer to the London Navy Base. It's, it's in Groton. It's always been in Groton. I'll call it that. Um, that was very really nice. I actually got, managed to get a tour, probably the one and only time since I, I have no connection with the Navy. I have no connection with, with electric boat. And so I don't often get a chance to go on a submarine other than the Nautilus. And this was an opportunity to go on the Missouri. It's tight, but you folks out there who work on subs and uh, already know that. Uh, also on the 29th, I was able to go up to, uh, uh, to Yukon at stores uh, to say a couple of words about our position on the closing of the Alexei von Schlippi uh, gallery, and I went with it. With uh, I was going to call you an attorney. You can still go to law school. If you, want. <laughs> if you haven't learned from Jim yet. Um, with uh, with uh, with Councillor Nault to uh, speak our piece. Uh, the Groton contingent, the, the the pro keeping it open or reopening it um, contingent was very large, very well spoken. Um, but it's UConn's facility, so they do what they want. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morton. Uh, yes, I uh, attended the band competition at Fitch High School on September 24th. And uh, once again, um, the Fitch Marching Band and Color Guard um, did us all proud. They were absolutely outstanding and really enjoyed the performances of all the different bands that competed. Thank you. Councilor Barber? I have nothing to report to. Councilor Perizzotti? Nothing to report. Councilor Nolte? I went to the same uh, board meeting with uh, Councillor Antipas, and um, I invited Marian, Mayor Marion Galbraith to go, and she spoke, um, which was, was nice, and uh, had some very good points about keeping that gallery open, and I think we came away with the thought that we were gonna have another letter written. It looks like they're going to close it, but we're gonna give it one more shot. Thank you. That's a good Nothing to report. Dr. Watson? I have nothing to report. Thank you. Um, I attended the uh, Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments on the 21st. Um, I met with uh, the RTM moderator, Scott Newsom, on the 23rd. And we're going to try to um, 
have the RTM and the council get together soon to talk budget and um, you know kind of lay out some things and not necessarily agree because I don't think we're all going to agree but at least get some things out on how we're going to move forward with the budget um, on September 25th I went to that Lions Club International uh, bus stop on the 26th I had a USS sale foundation board meeting um, and then I wanted to bring up mark the um, October 29th I received an invitation the dedication of the uh, submarine to Illinois and um, I'm allowed to bring up to six and I think Mark got an invitation to bring up to six and we wanted to see if the council wanted to go um, all councils are invited through us so the sooner we get your answer the sooner we can RSVP back what's the date um, it's October 29th it's 11 a.m. it's a Saturday it's a Saturday uh, but it sounds pretty cool you know like the, I don't it's know how many dedications to Definitely. commissioning yeah the, of, the, of the Illinois um, so if you guys could you know check your calendars and get back to us we'd love to have a the entire council <coughs> and town manager attending. So um, that's all I had. Uh, Clerk of the RTM. <coughs> Thank you. The uh, RTM will be meeting next week. Um, they don't have anything on their agenda, but I understand that they will have a referral uh, from this council this evening. Thank you. Clerk of the council. I uh, just want to report that uh, the uh, Elections uh, for the state election, uh, November 8th, the absentee ballots will be available this coming Friday, which is uh, October 7th. Um, this, my staff and I have, have completed, uh, nearly completed, putting together 350 um, applications that we've received already, um, that we've already mailed out 47 uh, overseas ballots. Those are not the actual ballots that you would be using in November. Those are special ballots that we that are designed by the Secretary of the State for the purpose of early balloting that has lists of candidates uh, but not in the format that you're accustomed to. Uh, so the um, the actual absentee ballots, we don't have them yet. We, we, we didn't actually get a list of candidates until last week, which was really unusual. There was a lawsuit that was pending and, and uh, resolved. Um, so this, uh, this Friday, if you um, are going to be uh, find that you're going to be unavailable on election day, or if you have an illness that prevents you to go to the polls, you're more than welcome either to uh, come in after Friday and vote right then. And we'll safely keep your ballot safe in our safe, <laughs> locked every night, uh, and it will be counted on election day with all the other ballots. So there's secrecy there, and um, you can count on us. Thank you, Tom Manager. Yes, just a couple of things. Just a reminder, this Saturday is the annual Grattan Fall Festival at the Quantic Plains Park from 11 to 5 p.m. Um, hopefully uh, a number of you, if not all of you, can swing by at some point. It's always a great event. Um, is I think, I, I believe John Reiner mentioned this uh, last week when he was here, but it is in your weekly status report. We have been able to submit the airport development zone application we we don't expect that we're going to hear back from the state until the end of this calendar year uh, but that has been a a project that we've been working on for a while also i think i sent this out electronically the eastern connecticut chamber of commerce on october 12th um, is having a session concerning um, building business with tax increment financing uh, it's a panel discussion I know we just had a briefing um, concerning TIFs uh, last week, uh, but this is a, a, a larger community discussion about TIFs. Uh, it's at starts at 7:30, and it is at the Hilton Garden Inn. The two two of the speakers are two of the folks that showed up last week. Um, so it, it is a complicated subject. I'm sure there will be questions that get asked and, and uh, since it's in town and since the two principals that are doing the talking are potentially thinking about doing a project in Groton, it would be good if we could have a couple folks uh, from the council. What's the date of that again? It's uh, the, tw uh, the 12th of October. At 7.30 p.m.? At 7.30 a.m. A.m. Um, to 9 a.m. at the um, at the Hilton Garden up on uh, Route 184. Thank you. Is that it? And last thing, um, I don't know how long they've been doing this, but I just saw this notice. We put it in your weekly status report. I know some of you were recently down to the uh, Cure Innovation Commons a couple weeks ago, uh, but 
believe it or not, on uh, the third Thursday of each uh, month, they're having something called Thirsty Thursday. It's basically a meet and greet, uh, share information, um, starts at 4.30, and um, sounds like fun if you're not doing something on a late, on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, on the third Thursday of the month, it, it may be worthwhile swinging, by, s swinging down and, and uh, seeing what's going on. And that's all I have. Thank you. Before we move on, I just want to remind the counselors that since there's no um, other business on this, um, on the agenda, if people have things that they wanted to have brought up for future discussion or, you know, for future agendas, now's the time to, to bring that up. Councilor Noel? I just have a couple calendar things. The Groton Business Association special meeting that I told you about last week, instead of being in the morning at 7.30 to 9, is going to be on the 18th at Outer Lights Brewery at 5 p.m. And then the planning department, I think, is the one sponsoring the FOIA workshop, and that's on the 19th at 6 p.m. Thank you. I also wanted to mention um, that uh, the city and town are meeting tomorrow with regards to police with the police chiefs. That's taking place tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think that's it. So, moving on, committee reports. Harry? Oh, Harry. Uh, <laughs> personnel and um, appointments met tonight, but we will, I won't report for two weeks. Okay, thank you. Dean, the rules committee on, did not meet, correct? Correct. And the committee of the whole met last week. We discussed a number of items, of which three are on the agenda tonight. So, we will. Um, Move on to those new business. Um, the first one, 2016-0231, Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut grant. And Harry, can you take that one? Absolutely. Uh, resolution authorizing the town manager or his designee to apply to the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut slash Women and Girls Funds for grant to continue Groton's Child Abuse Prevention Initiative. Whereas funding is available via the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut's Women and Girls Fund for initiatives aimed at promoting healthy relationships and reducing domestic violence. And whereas Groton Human Services Child Abuse Prevention Initiative is focused on building strong families and eliminating viol violence against children. And whereas funding from the Women and Girls Fund will enable the continuation of Groton's Child Abuse Prevention Initiative. Uh, therefore, be it resolved that the town council hereby authorizes the town manager or his designee to apply to the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut's Women and Girls Fund for grant funds in the amount of $2,500, which will be utilized by Groton Human Services to continue its child abuse prevention initiative in fiscal year 2017. Uh, I so move. Second. We have a motion by Councilor Watson and a second by Councilor Grimm. Any discussion on this? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That passes eight to zero to zero. Councilor Grimm, can you take uh, 2016 0236? Sure. Resolution for fiscal year 2017 general contingency transfers, whereas the town charter provides the general contingency. Transfer during this year, and whereas during fiscal year 2017 budget deliberations, only the labor agreements for CILU telecommunications employees had been settled, and those wages increases were included in the department's 2017 budget. Whereas the 2017 budget deliberations, labor agreements, pay plans were not known, were not included in the department's budget for the remaining, remaining employee groups. CILU, Clerical, United Steelworkers, Parks, Public Works, Police, and Non-Union. And whereas wage increases for one of those groups, United Steelworkers, Parks, Public Works, are not known and should be incorporated into a no, department. Now known. Are now known and should be incorporated into a department's fiscal year 2017 budget for a general contingency transfer whereas during budget deliberations, funds were included in the general contingency and 
anticipation of wage adjustments occurring during the fiscal year for a total contingency appropriation of $425,000. And whereas before this transfer is applied, the general contingency fund has a balance of $413,000 and resolved that $48,000, $190 be transferred from the general fund contingency function number 1074 to the general fund department's functions and refer to the general and to the RTM for approval. I say move. Second. We have a motion by Councilor Grimm, a second by Councilor Null. Any discussion on this? Councilor Antibas. Should the, wondering if the motion should be amended to specify the breakdown, do we think that that matters? The breakdown from how much is coming from another In other words, we're, we, the motion as it stands would be 48,190. There is a breakdown between Public Works and Parks and Rec. Yes, I would certainly recommend that. This is kind of wordy the way we finally wrote this, but it does make reference to the, that last, that resolve does say to the following general fund department's functions. Well, then I, I, uh, I move to amend the motion to include the breakdown of the 48,190 as follows. Public works, $41,575. Parks and Recreation, $6,615. We have a motion and a second to amend the, um, the, the, the original resolution. Thank you. The original <laughs> resolution. Um, why am I getting old? Uh, so okay. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of that say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed. The amendment. That passes eight to zero to zero. As amended. And now, uh, the main motion as amended. The main motion as amended. Thank you. That's the one. Um, any discussion on that? The main motion as amended. Is there a second? But there was a second. There was a second. It was okay, a second. I didn't. Oh. Yeah. All right. Seeing that all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstention? That passes 8 to 0 0. Cousin Ong, you take 2016-0241. Uh, I would be happy to. Uh, resolution authorizing changes to job des descriptions in the Office of Planning and Development Services, whereas the Town of Groton Office of Planning and Development Services is changing three job descriptions to better meet the needs of the town and the department, and whereas the job description changes as proposed will not create any new full-time positions during the current fiscal, fiscal year, and whereas the job descriptions being changed are as follows. Assistant building slash zoning official, code enforcement officer slash planner one, and executive assistant office of planning and development services. And whereas these proposed changes will better serve the goals of, and the mission of the Department of Planning and Development Services, now therefore be it resolved that the town council hereby approves the three above Jeff reference job descriptions as attached to the agenda. So moved. Second. Thank you, Councilor Moyne. We have a proposed by Councilor Noah, the second by Councilor Morton. Any discussion on this? I will. Go ahead, Deb. So last week in our discussion, I had asked in general, um, basically what was the are we all having right. this trouble tonight talking? <laughs> I did it in my earlier meeting too. Um, I had asked in general what the cost effect would be. Um, and based on the description that was given to us at the time, it really said that there wasn't gonna be much of a, of, of a cost increase to the budget. So I asked a little bit more information tonight in regards to basically the current position and basically what the new position was gonna be. And I'm asking because there were some things in this job description that I didn't understand when I went back through a second time. So for example, um, when you're talking about the assistant building zoning official, it says union pay grade GM, GMEA level six. So to me, level six means absolutely nothing. I, I don't know the terminology of that. So I asked in the ninth hour here, so bear with me, um, for, for Bob and John to give me a little bit more information 
so my first question to them was in regards to the executive assistant position that you had given me the current rate and the new rate to be and I know all the counselors do not have this information because I just got it but based on what you're telling me her uh, the the current position is a hourly union position and you're telling me that it's a current level six which it looks to me when I do the math out she has topped out at her level six so at this stage she really has nowhere else to go so I want to be clear because when we go to her next position which would be non-union salary level six it looks as though um, her her pay grade is actually lower than what she's making now because you had included a certain amount of overtime but it looks as though over the last um, five years we've increased by like eight thousand dollars in this particular position so I guess I want to just talk about this because I just want to make sure that we're making the right choice and that we're not going to get ourselves stuck in a position you know down the road as far as okay we've made these job descriptions thinking that we are making the right choice and now all of a sudden we're having to pay more out you know in salary and benefits or what have you versus the hourly pay and overtime so I don't know right now because I just got this information if I've actually processed it long enough but do you want to come back up and have a further discussion about this please do they want to <laughs> sure. John Reiner, <laughs> Director of Planning and Development Services. So there are really three different job descriptions that are before you. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk about the office assistant three to the executive assistant position first. Okay. The current position is hourly, is eligible for overtime, and gets longevity. So the bottom step, and also with the, in the union positions, you're guaranteed those steps. In the non-union, you're not necessarily guaranteed those steps. It's more if the council approves um, the 2% increase or an annual increase, that's our only real increase. Uh, I mean, I don't know if Mark wants to weigh in on any of that, but there, there's a difference between the union and the non-union. So generally, what, come, what you would come in at as a non-union you might get an increase, uh, a COLA, or what the council gives during the budget, but there's not necessarily a guaranteed step every year. Okay. I guess I just was just trying to figure out, I mean, I read through, but then when you kind of look at the numbers and you see somebody that gets to the top of their pay scale, I want to make sure that we're making the right changes in the right places for the right reasons, mm -hmm. not just so that we have another place for her to go or him to go mm -hmm. when they have now reach the top of their level okay I get you um, we're also expanding the the duties uh, the job description putting more there's confidential matters on here there's more project management there's more uh, technical assistance helping with the budget with the capital improvement pro program things beyond where the job is today so it's putting more responsibility on. So there may be a slight increase in pay over time, but it's also the responsibilities are being stacked on. That's what I see the needs in the department right now. If things change three years, five years from now, I or whoever's standing in my position will come and talk to you about either eliminating the position or modifying it down in, in whichever direction is needed. So we're trying to look at how can we adjust the department to changing times. A lot of these job descriptions haven't been changed in many, many years. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to just do this proactively, little by little. And you know, the, the areas I really haven't played with in, in the time that I've been here have been the managing uh, inspection services and building department which you have two of those before you mm -hmm. and with the office assistant we really haven't done much with those um, I imagine sometime you know working with Bob in the union it wouldn't surprise me if over the next couple of years there are changes to those um, they don't reference the abacus anymore in the office assistant positions but some of them might be a little outdated okay 
Um, so I guess just in general, as a learning experience going forward, um, I work in the medical industry, so when I see document changes come through, I'm used to seeing like, oh, this is what's been removed, and then this is kind of what's been added. And um, if we could just do that on future job descriptions, just so, you know, if you're telling us that these things haven't been changed in a long time, then we're not really sure where we started from versus where we're getting to. I mean, I can't look at this and say what she's doing now versus what her new job descriptions are. But I also think it's important when we're sitting up here trying to make financial decisions based on job descriptions and growth and direction of, we need to have a better idea ahead of time how much financial impact the impact overall is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, because eventually this will, I mean, currently right this second, you know, it's not going to affect us, but again, it's still, it's a, it's a level change in a way. Mm -hmm. um, even though the overtime is not going to be accounted for anymore, it does still change the cards a little bit. So I, I just want to make sure that we're making the right choices based on the, the financial impact, not just now, but four or five years down the road. Correct. So Here, yeah. that's just a general from any job description change across the board. Are you taking a non-union position, uh, excuse me, a union position and putting it into a non-union position? Yes. The intent is to take someone existing on staff who is in a union position and move them into a non-union position. Okay. And is that all three of the? No. No. Just the one. Just this one. Just the one. Um, and then the assistant building zoning official position, that's a position that existed prior to um, how the Office of Planning and Development Services is together now. So it's a position that used to exist. We changed the job description a little bit. That's something that I don't plan on filling today. I have two employees within the department that would be eligible for that position, but I'm more looking at succession planning for when two of my three inspectors, including the current manager of inspection services, are eligible to retire, that could happen the next six months for one, a year, or many years. But I, I want to be ready and prepared for that. And then the third position, that Code Enforcement Planner 1, that one's actually going to be uh, somewhere around a $2,000 or so less um, to the budget. So one may go up a little bit, the other one's going to go down. And with that Code in, uh, Enforcement Planner 1 position, the salary wasn't the problem as much before. It was more the recruitment. When someone goes to code enforcement, that's kind of a, there's not a lot of growth there. If you add some of those interesting planner duties to it, we have a much larger recruitment and applicant pool to pull people in so then we can start, again, that succession planning. I have a number of planners that will be retiring sometime in the next three to five years. So I'm starting to think about the next stock of people that are going to be coming in. Okay. Yes. Uh, as, uh, as I did last week, I'm going to support this only because I don't, I don't believe in, um, in getting things ready, that if, there, if these are positions that you need, you should be altering the department now and putting those people either, you know, losing people who aren't up to the job and putting people into the positions that that, you know, that to make the department run better, clearly you're doing this to make, you know, to, to make it a well-oiled machine. And to, to say that you're going to wait and you, know, you want these on, online for when these people do retire, whether it be one, three, or five years from now, I would say if it's, if it's that important, if these positions are that important, then make moves now and get the department running the way that you want to. And if they're not, then come back to us when you're ready to hire, you know, to, to change things when the people are gone, like setting it up for, um, for the future without having people to fill them or you know, to go out and hire them right away. I think I don't, I don't like that. And, um, as far as the executive assist assistant goes, um, you know, people are, when, when people hit a, a ceiling of a salary, um, those, those are there for a reason. You know, so you either, you, they're meant to get you to move on, to grow, and get in another position that, that, you know, allows you to keep growing, but not to stay in the position. Um, and in this particular instance, it looks like you're creating a position 
for the person to step into to continue to grow, um, which that 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 I can I, I can kind of understand, but there's something I don't know. I just there's something I don't like about it. Um, but you know the the other positions, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I, like I, if I was anybody in planning, and you were saying you might you three or whoever many employees is might retire one three in five years when you do we're going to make your job description better or whatever you're you know improve upon it to better the department my point is to do it now and and better the department now and do whatever it is that you need to do so that you can make it better um, maybe I wasn't communicating this properly so the code enforcement planner one position is a vacant position right now Today it's a code enforcement position. So I'm changing it so that I can make the department better now. My head planner, uh, Deb Jones, the assistant director of planning, used to be an environmental planner, a planner two. When she was promoted, we looked at what's the best role to bring a new person in, and do we fill the planner two, a higher salaried position, or do we try to fill in with a lower paid position, someone that's entry level, so we can start training people now. So a lot of it is that. So we wanna start training people now that are gonna be more entry level, so that in one, three, or five years, when those people are ready, they can go into those planner two positions or those higher level positions, because they're not ready today. So it's, we're trying to avoid bringing people in at the planner two or the, the high level two because then in five years they're going to hit their ceiling and then they might want to leave. So we're trying to figure out a way of how can we attract people at a lower level, train them on the job, and allow opportunities for promotion. So that actually is the instance in the code enforcement which is currently vacant. The office assistant two, someone has great capabilities to do more so yes, we're creating a position to allow that person to grow so they don't leave the organization or go to a, another slot within the town. So I, I'm trying to keep valuable people there now. And it, you know, as I said last week, within my uh, building and inspections department, there's no one that I want to get rid of today. I'm trying to anticipate when someone retires. I have two people eligible to retire. That doesn't mean they're bad employees. It just means at some point in the next few years, they're going to leave. Right now, we don't op have options to encourage people to retire sooner. They're both doing great jobs. I hope Kevin Quinn never leaves. Thoroughly confused me now. <laughs> um, I, I get the e executive assistant, okay? And you're saying that the office planner one is vacant right now? The, the code enforcement officer position. Today there's a position that exists, code enforcement officer, going out looking at uh, sign violations, any zoning violations, mm -hmm. blight, that position's vacant. How long has it been vacant for? That gentleman left the position three, three four months ago. Mm -hmm. I want to say three months ago, and we haven't filled it. We haven't advertised, it's budgeted, and it's something that we need. We haven't filled it because we've been trying to work through these changes and get it right. And the assistant building zoning official is the one that you're waiting for someone to retire? Not waiting. Not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, again, I have two people within the division today that are eligible, theoretically, for that position. One of them is also eligible at, uh, eligible to retire at this point in time. The other one is a newer employee to the department that has capabilities to grow. I mean, he's working on a master's in public administration right now. He has a higher aspirations, but I'm not guaranteeing anyone that job. It's something that I want to have available. And then six months, a year from now, if we see that opportunity to have either an existing person or if one of these other eligible for retirement people do retire, well, maybe we'll open that up outside of the organization. So some of it all depends on what happens within the department. So it's not that I'm trying to push somebody out the door. I, and I don't want to add any new full-time employees. So that's the whole purpose of trying to reshuffle what we have. 
Okay. And so with respect to the assistant building slash zoning official, putting it all together, I, I know I asked you this last week, have the position there, somebody internally may qualify for it, somebody externally may qualify for it, but in the end, uh, for that job, let's say that somebody else, okay. So if you were thinking that should be filled from the outside, so I don't have anybody qualified on the inside, either they're not qualified or they're not desirous of it, and so it remains an open position, and somebody were to say, you know, I noticed or I heard you have this position. You find you they'd be a really great fit, but we've already got the 14 full-time employee roster. You'd have to wait for one of those FTEs to go before you can hand this lady or gentleman the job if they were qualified. Is that pretty much how it would, how it would work out? So even if you found somebody, you'd have, they'd have to wait until somebody retired. Or until someone left. On or their left under other, other reasons, yeah. Yes. yeah. Which, I mean... We've had turnover within the department of people looking to move on to other organizations. So that's always a possibility. And, also. If, it and if it turns out that you're looking at an internal hire, mm -hmm. then they would move from position A to this new position. And if position A is eliminated, so we maintain our Correct. 14 FTE. I think it's 14. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's important. Yeah, I think. Um, what gets a little muddied in all this is that we're talking about job descriptions and a smart department, smart HR department, a smart department head constantly plans and looks ahead for and does succession planning. You have key people in positions, you know those people are going to be eligible at a, at a certain time to retire. If you're smart, you start looking at your job descriptions. Um, in a perfect world, you would look at all of them every year, mm -hmm. and you constantly update them so that you don't ever get in a situation where somebody is walking out the door and you know what you need in that position, but your job description is so outdated that it needs to be rewritten and that process takes time so I understand what you're doing I think it's smart I think it's the prudent thing to do and I do support it and I think you know we have to trust you that this isn't going to be an increase in your budget mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be an increase in FTEs and just take it from there yeah. but I, I support the the new job descriptions. Thank you. I concur with Co Councillor Morton. I think it's a great uh, planning ahead, and I also hope Deb Jones or Kevin Quinn never leave. Yeah. But they probably will at some at point. At some point in time, they will. Right, Councillor Morton, I agree with you. That, that my only issue when I'm trying to wrap my head around is that. The, uh, the, for the department, for his department to run efficiently, he needs these job descriptions. But he's not going to fill them until there's an there's a, there's a opportunity to fill them. So whatever that gap is from when we're creating these job descriptions to when you fill them is, to me, lost opportunity. Because if, they're, if your department runs better, more efficiently with these new <coughs> job descriptions, then why don't we? Why don't you go right into doing whatever you need to do, whether it be eliminate positions or promote people or, or move it that way, as opposed to having them and waiting there for this gap to fill in. When you're to me, it's a lost opportunity. So actually, two of these I will be filling in the next two to three months, okay. just through the through the process. So tomorrow morning, I'm calling Bob and saying, "All right, Bob, what do I need to do to get this code enforcement planner one position advertised?" as soon as possible that's a vacant position i need it filled we're getting lots of zoning complaints sign complaints blight complaints i'm sure some of you are i need that filled yesterday once we get that one moving ahead the office assistant to executive assistant i'll get that straightened out and then the only one that i'm waiting on is that building zoning one that's the only one that i'm going to just sit back and wait and see how things go Two out of three ain't bad. Yeah. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, okay, but one, one more thing. The, 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 my concern with your methodology is this. If <clears throat> the department is, let's say it does what Karen says, which is annually reviews the, the job description and says, you know, we can, we can refine them, we can do better, we can... How long before you establish kind of a precarious environment where people realize that you know, HR is going annually going through the or regularly going through the uh, the job descriptions? That must mean necessarily you wouldn't want people working in that kind of an environment. Um, I think if I think if you were proposing a raft of job descriptions saying the department's good, but it could be really good with these descriptions, I think that might require a serious look at your existing group of employees, but I don't think, I don't see this as so radical a change, so radical a realignment that you just got to give some people, you know, a cake and a heave ho. So. Okay. How's it going? Just to uh, the mayor's point, I think um, the one reason I believe you want the assistant building zoning official position is so you'll have two people then that can issue certificate of occupancies and rule on zoning regs? Yes. But to his point then, if, if that's a good thing, you know, why don't we move forward on that, you know, sooner than later? If the opportunity arises for an internal hire, that's something we can do. Otherwise, aside from laying someone off, I have to wait till someone retires. and. It, I have good people on the positions right now. We've made it work in the past, but it's always been a little, uh, people have had to wait. So I, I have to operate within the structure of, of state laws, local you know, HR and, and best practices. So we can't push somebody out the door if they're doing a good job. Well, I'm not advocating that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter. Any more discussion on this? Seeing that all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? That passes eight to zero to zero. Thank you. I think that about wraps it up. Second. We're adjourned.